Thank you for joining and welcome to Designing Out Waste. My name is Miriam Brode and I'm the program director of UrbanX. For those who don't know us, UrbanX is a venture accelerator by many and the venture fund Urban Us dedicated to startups reimagining city life. And as far as reimagining city life, now more than ever, we believe that it is crucial to reimagine our food value chain and to design out waste while hopefully creating value for businesses and stakeholders. This is exactly the topic of the conversation that we're about to have. Our partners for this event are AgriTexture, CivLab, Baldor, Closer Partners, Ambrosia, and most importantly, Circular City Week New York. Circular City Week New York is a yearly event that aims to redesign urban living through exploring the topic of circular economy from different perspectives. With over 50 events planned and 4,000 RSVPs, Circular City Week would have almost doubled in size since last year. But as you know, the virus crisis had different plans for us. Now instead, it will be Circular City season. So look out for those postponed events, which will hopefully go live later this spring. Before we get started, I would like to thank our speakers who remain committed and kept the, and kept the positive spirit amid last minute changes, which I think speaks to the relevance and importance of this conversation. And since we can't meet in person, we'd like to encourage everyone to engage online with our Twitter account at UrbanXXL, hashtag designing out waste. And please feel free to ask questions. Our team will be working behind the scenes to gather your questions, which will be answered by a panelist following the discussion. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our moderator, uh, Alison Shapiro, um, Executive Director at Close Loop Partners. Alison is responsible for strategic partnerships, capital formation, and fund structuring across the Close Loop Partners platform. Previously, um, Allison worked at JP Morgan and in the clean energy space. Thank you, Allison. Um, the mic is yours. Actually, we're gonna have the speakers introduce themselves now. Um, Allison will be reconnecting in a second. So um, Thomas, if you could go first. Sure, um, good evening, everyone. Greetings from Greenwich, Connecticut. It's a pleasure to join all of you. My name is Thomas McQuillan. I'm Vice President of Strategy, Culture, and Sustainability at Baldor Specialty Foods in New York. Uh, we specialize in distributing food produce mainly, but also specialty foods to customers from Portland, Maine to Richmond, Virginia. Um, we sell food service accounts, retail accounts, and wholesale accounts. Uh, within our business, we also um, have a fresh cuts operation, which processes about a million and a half pounds of produce a week. Uh, and from that produce production, we have a lot of remaining food. And about five years ago, we started off on a journey to find a home for that food um, so that it would be fully utilized. And today we'll talk a little bit more about that journey and the value that it's created for Baldor and why it's something that hopefully will motivate other companies to, to follow suit. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Ricky, do you wanna go next? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Ricky Stevens. I'm the Director of Digital Strategy at Agritecture Consulting. Uh, my background's in the digital marketing world. I spent four years at a company called Red Ventures. Then I moved to New York about three years ago, really inspired by <clears throat> all that I saw that was happening in the sustainable food and agriculture movement. Um, I started a company called AgTech X, which was New York City's first incubator and sort of experimental lab. Um, focused on all things ag tech and sustainable food systems. I ran that for about two years. And then in 2019, we were acquired by Agritecture. So I've been with the Agritecture team about nine years, or sorry, about nine months. Um, the company itself is about five years old. And what we do is we are a technology agnostic urban agriculture consulting firm. Um, so what that means is <clears throat> we, uh, we are not aligned. Uh, we, we don't align ourselves with one specific solution or technology. Rather, what we do is we work with every one of our clients um, to respect what their goals are, and we try to go out and find the best solutions um, for their farm. Um, and then more recently, we've been working with cities and other um, stakeholders within the urban environment to work on local food system planning and projects like that. Amanda, do you want to go next? 
Thank you so much for having me. Um, I think it's a testament to how close knit this community is where I've actually met almost all of you in person. I've known you for several years now. Um, so my company Ambrosia has been um, in operation for over six years. We've taken a lot of uh, twists and turns in the effort to valorize and create a market for food waste. Where we've ended up is um, attempting to take food waste that is not fit for consumption um, and convert that into chemicals and ingredients for use in personal care and household products. And we just recently, um, ironically, launched a cleaning product. And I think we have Alison back. Um, Alison, welcome. Oops, I think I'm off mute now. Um, hi, everyone. Sorry about that. My I had um, kind of login issues, but great to be here tonight with everyone. I also think it's a testament to how tech enabled we are that we were able to pull together what was previously an in-person event online, virtually and live so quickly. Um, I am an executive director at Closed Loop Partners, which is a New York City based investment firm and innovation hub for the circular economy that began like almost all of my colleagues um, about six years ago with just one infrastructure fund that invested in physical recycling infrastructure in North America and has since expanded with the growth of interest in uh, advanced recycling technologies and circular economy into six investment funds and an innovation hub. So we now invest in packaging and food and agriculture and advanced materials and robotics, all having to do with circular economy business models or solutions and our innovation hub, which is called the Center for the Circular Economy, provides research analysis and pre-competitive collaboration to enable systems change. So we work with leading players across the industry to um, identify bottlenecks, to help them resolve infrastructure challenges through shared solutions. We run accelerators and um, also can, can um, help map material flows. So I'm thrilled to be here with, with the three panelists that have just introduced themselves. And I'd like to start by having everyone please spend just a couple of minutes explaining your companies to the group on the phone um, and your roles in the firm. I know you just very briefly um, spoke about them, but maybe in the context of this conversation, we can focus on how your companies eliminate waste in your own operations and your own supply chain. So Tom, if we could, let's start with you. Okay, thanks so much. So um, for, for us at Baldor, it really came down to uh, a reevaluation of the way we classified food products that we once considered something that should be part of the waste stream as a usable food item. And it meant taking a different look or a fresh look at a carrot peel or a potato peel or a celery butt. In production, if we are processing a million and a half pounds of produce a week, which we are, you kind of lose sight of the fact that there's all this other food product remaining as a result of the production. And our, uh, my charge was to look at all of this food that remains um, and find a way to put it to use. And so early on, one of the things we did is we identify, we changed the narrative a little bit by giving it a name. We call that food Sparks. Scraps fell backwards with a C. And Sparks captures the imagination of people who might otherwise not be willing to use a wasted food product in cooking. But Sparks is kind of fun and gives you an opportunity to say, hey, is there a way to use a carrot peel um, for, as, a, as an ingredient, for example, in a cookie or uh, in a broth? So Sparks has really changed the narrative. It's given us the opportunity to put all of this food to use. And I'm proud to say since November 10, 2016, we placed 100% of this food, which now amounts to more than 20 million pounds of food. Great. Thank you very much, um, Tom. All right, Ricky, do you want to share some insight from either agri agriculture or any of your clients? Yeah, so being a consulting firm, um, you know, for us, we don't really have, um, and we're actually, we recently decided to become pretty much a fully remote company, so good timing for us. Um, but for us, we think about it really in terms of our, our clients. So, uh, you know, each of our clients um, has their own goals, as I mentioned before. To give you a bit, of, a bit of a better understanding, most of our clients tend to be entrepreneurs, farmers, business owners who are looking to start or expand upon their controlled environment agriculture operations. So that means 
generally either greenhouses or vertical farms, fully indoor vertical farms. Um, one of the things we started implementing is, you know, we found that some clients had the assumption that uh, because they were um, using hydroponics or they were um, uh, basically growing in a more efficient and less resource intensive way, that that was automatically more sustainable. Um, and there's definitely some truth to that, but there's also a, a level of complexity uh, within there, especially when it comes to energy um, with indoor farms, it can be quite energy intensive to run those farms. So one of the things we started doing is we would automatically include a sustainability assessment um, in some of our proposals. Um, so that was a good way of just uh, getting our clients to think a little bit more about um, what the impact, uh, the true impact, the total kind of life cycle uh, assessment um, of their farm might be. Um, and then in regards to just our, our company, you know, what we try to do is a lot of advocacy work, but more from a systemic level. So we're part of a, an organization called the NYC Ag Collective here in New York. Um, it's about 15 organizations, um, a number of different types of urban farming, for-profits and non-profits. And collectively, we spent a good chunk of the last three or four years um, advocating for a comprehensive urban agriculture plan. We were actually able to get that bill in front of the New York City Council twice. Um, it's yet to fully come to fruition, but there's been some really good conversations um, and a couple initiatives that have come out of it. Um, so that's that's generally how we think about, about the world. Great, thank you. And Amanda, over to you. So for our cleaner, which we, as I said, just launched, um, it wasn't enough for us to be making a product almost entirely from food waste. 97% of our ingredients are derived from food waste, but we had to pull that thread through, through our packaging, our shipping, and it took forever to find the right partners, to find the right materials to use. There are not very many options for packaging that's truly circular. Um, and so we, our bottle is um, aluminum and that has made it much more expensive typically than cleaners and cleaners are expected to be very cheap. Um, and so we've had to balance out the you know, waste in our operations, our supply chain, um, our packaging with the cost and with the perception of what cleaning products should be, and then also, you know, reach this other hurdle of getting people to buy a cleaner that's made from food waste, which are kind of opposite uh, concepts, really. Um, and so, you know, we have put a lot of thought and, and, and a lot of work into trying to make the least wasteful product possible. Excellent. So Amanda, that dovetails nicely into my next question for each of you. So I think Amanda, if you wouldn't mind also answering first for this next one, that would be great. Can you help um, us understand what are some of the critical challenges that you uh, as in your own companies or that your clients face in including zero waste goals as part of your overall sustainability agenda? So Amanda, we can start with you again, since you've already right. introduced nicely a couple of those topics. Um, yeah, there are many facets to that problem. And I think uh, a, a major issue in the waste industry in general is end markets and is trying to create that, um, that supply chain for waste materials so that there are solutions for them to begin with. Um, we're dealing with a crisis with plastic waste because there's no more market for plastics recycling. And in order to have a waste system that can keep up with the waste that's being generated, you, you need to be able to in, first incentivize the waste generators to reduce their waste, to choose responsible partners for recycling or taking out that waste. Um, but then you also need to create value from that because without that value, you know, that whole system breaks down. Yep, thank you. And as somebody who spends her working days thinking about building end markets for recycling, um, there actually, there are um, end markets for plastic waste, but you're totally right that there, you don't get the same recovery per ton of, of recycled plastic resin that you did 
before uh, China and other countries imposed import restrictions. So you're right, it has become a challenge for certain kinds of plastic waste. Um, so Tom, let's talk to you. How, how does Baldor, what, what are some of the challenges that, that you and your colleagues have faced at Baldor in including zero waste goals as part of a sustainability agenda? Well, the, the first thing that I have to mention is, you know, what makes something waste? What makes something waste, in my mind, is a product that no longer has a useful life. And even in the case of Amanda's business, she's taking this product and creating a valuable, useful product out of it. So I, I regret when I hear anything that's used as an input as waste because it suggests that, well, if we didn't do this with it, it wouldn't matter what we did with it. We could just discard it. Well, in fact, over the last few centuries, we've done that with food. And so our work collectively is really challenging because we give ourselves permission to discard food. We just don't see the issue behind whether or not we utilize food or don't utilize food. And it wouldn't be until we didn't have access to food, as you see some folks in some communities these days experiencing, that would lead us to say, wow, food is really valuable. Let's eat all of it. So, so having said that, one of the things we needed to do uh, very early on in this process was to convince the leadership team that this food actually was food and wasn't waste. And the way I did that initially was I started cooking it. So I made a gratin out of potato peelings and we made cookies out of um, the, the carrot peelings. And those things got people's attention to say, well, wait a minute, wow, this is really delicious. I didn't realize you could eat this. And we started looking at all this food that was generated and say, hey, is there a way we can utilize it? And Initially, we came up with solutions to feed animals when those solutions still exist today. But in many instances now, we're actually extracting some of that food product uh, to create human-grade food products. Um, and it just makes us create less. Well, in our case, we're utilizing 100% of it. So now we live in a world where there is no waste coming from our fresh cuts operation. And I think that's really the answer, looking to change standard operating procedures to put all of this food to use. Great. That's very laudable. Um, all right, Ricky, tell us about some of, of the challenges your clients face in vertical farming or other ur urban agricultural um, settings when they try to achieve zero waste. Yeah, so um, one of the interesting things is because we're working with a lot of new farmers, we actually did a, a, do a quick plug to a, um, a survey or report that we put out at the end of last year with a company called AutoGrow. Um, it's called the Global CEA Census Report. So we survey about 350 controlled environment growers around the world. Um, and one of the things we found was, I think it was 47%, very close to 50% of the farmers that we surveyed were new to agriculture um, altogether. And so, you know, that is that is probably our, um, our biggest chunk of the entire pie of clients are, are people like that, where, you know, this for them is a second career. Um, so they're, they're coming to this with a lot of energy, a lot of enthusiasm, um, certainly some advantages and resources that they can bring, um, but also a number of constraints and generally just a lack of, of experience. And what we find is one of the things they, they forget about is um, all the knowledge that it takes to actually run a farming operation. Um, and if you don't necessarily have a, a ton of experience or you haven't hired a really experienced head grower, you are going to have waste um, on your farm. Why is that going to occur? That's going to occur because of um, labor inefficiencies, potentially. It's going to occur because of uh, pest or disease outbreaks because you didn't realize uh, the humidity um, uh, you, know, you needed to grow a certain type of crop um, or you bought the wrong equipment and you decided to grow a, a different crop with, with equipment that doesn't really work into, from an HVAC perspective. So there's a, there's a, a million different things that can... Um, if they're not perfectly lined up, can lead to a lot of waste on the farm. So one of the things that we do, you know, one of our core services is feasibility studies, is we really try to piece together, um, you know, what does your team look like? What does your operation look like? Um, what crops are you growing? What climate are you growing it in? Um, and then we try to minimize that waste curve. Uh, but generally just showing them what that waste curve might look like based on some of their initial assumptions will really make them realize, you know, a, from a sustainability standpoint, yes, but also just from a pure economic standpoint, standpoint from a financial standpoint, they realize, wow, we can't afford to be wasting 30% of our crop um, 
in year one and year two, year, year two. So that's the thing that really uh, hits them um, first. And that's, so that's kind of just from an agritecture client perspective. I do want to mention too, just from, um, from like an overall systemic standpoint, um, you know, I think one of the things that's interesting is there's this assumption that a lot of waste from, you know, bigger industrial kind of conventional farms is um, the thing we hear a lot about, ugly produce, definitely a, an important topic. Um, but the interesting thing is there's a lot of different factors that go into um, why there's, there's food waste at the farm level. One example is just labor shortages from immigration policies. That's been a big thing in the last couple of years that have hurt a lot of farms, especially in California, that depend on seasonal labor from, from south of the border. Um, so there's, there's a lot of different factors. It's not always the ones that um, you, might, you might think about that go into waste on the farm. Fascinating. Um, um, all right. Well, I think, um, Amanda, you, you started to touch on this a bit, and Tom, you did as well, but it would be great to hear from, from each of you what cultural challenges specifically, just calling that category out, you face in trying to help your, your peers, your prospective clients, your suppliers um, think about harnessing the value that comes from either food or agricultural waste from your suppliers or from your own operations. So maybe we can start with you, Amanda, since you alluded to um, the marketing challenge of, of marketing cleaners that are actually made from, from food waste. Yeah, we spent a lot of time last year on messaging, on imagery. I had a lot of conversations with our branding agency at the time. I didn't want to show pictures of the food waste. You know, I wanted to sort of allude to it, not really talk about it. And then I kind of came around a little bit more and we're still walking the line and testing out how we talk about it. Um, uh, one of my last uh, board meetings is uh, my board members. I was sharing, showing some of our ads and they said, what if you thought about calling it something else, like not food waste, like something else? And I was like, like what? <laughs> um, you know, because it is, it, it really is the core value proposition of our product. And we have a huge opportunity to educate people. And one of the ways that we've done this is to really make this more about supply chain. So one of the things that we've done, we, we coined this term called resource negative, where we're saying we're taking a waste material that would have gone to a landfill you know, caused uh, greenhouse gas emissions, landfills are the third largest methane contributor in the US. And we made ingredients with them for, for a product. And by doing that, we're also saving raw materials that would have been used to make a similar product. So by doing this, we're simplifying the supply chain, we're making these ingredients and formulating the product ourselves, which is also like very, um, strange, like most consumer products are made by third parties, by contractors, you know, there are a bunch of vendors involved, the ingredients are coming from all over the place. And just the fact that we're making all of our ingredients ourselves is groundbreaking on its own. So we're really trying to refocus the, um, the imagery I think that people have in their minds of using food waste or, you know, Tom using sparks or using any kind of, you know, we say, we try to say excess food or we, we've tried so many different ways of, of how do you say it, um, kind of reframing it as a raw material that can save resources and not only you know, reducing the environmental impact of waste is something that I think people are responding to. And I think that our role here is really in educating consumers in this category. And I hope that you know, this category will then expand. I think there'll be more and more demand for products made this way when people realize the bigger picture. Great, thank you. Um, Tom, how about at Baldor when you're talking well, with your clients about, um, about this? Amanda, I can help but say that I think I would love to see in the front of your bottle, the main ingredient is food that might otherwise be wasted. Um, but uh, so, yeah, so at Baldor, we, uh, I think one of the issues I confront, and I hear this over and over, there is this assumption that sustainability strategies or initiatives are going to come as a cost to the company. No matter how much information you provide, or even financials that speak for themselves, you're still going to be questioned as, as to whether or not the net, net, net savings, if there is a natural net, net, net savings 
related to that sustainability strategy, or in fact, does it come to the company as a cost? I, I, I think about all sustainability initiatives the opposite way. And so that always struck me as sort of interesting whenever I'd be challenged as to whether or not the strategy we're putting in place was costing us more money. Um, but that's something that, that needs to be taken into consideration right away. And in very simple terms, the cost to go to landfill or cost to go to transfer per ton out of New York City is roughly $110 a ton. We found a solution to with our animal feed uh, partner, which is a primary primary partner that we have at $66 a ton. So you could do the math there. And I shared with you earlier how much we generate. You can see over the last three years how, how much economic value that creates for Baldor. Um, the other question is uh, that might come up, is it safe to, to handle food that might, uh, might otherwise be wasted uh, safely for human consumption? And so I would ask chefs and others the question, at what point does food ever become waste? And categorically, they'll say, when it hits the garbage pail. I say, well, if it doesn't hit the garbage pails, it never wastes. Well, I guess you're right. So let's treat it. All this food product, let's find ways to use this food we otherwise didn't use to make other products, but treat it responsibly like all the other food we, tr we treat. So at Baldor, sparks are treated just like the rest of the products that we manage. And then um, the last thing I just wanted to make uh, mention is you know, how are you going to store it? And so finding space and making sure you, you allocate space for this food product to be stored properly will guarantee success. But those are the hurdles that you kind of have to change and the cultural changes that need to be put in place to be successful. That was excellent. And I, pick, I particularly appreciate, um, Tom, that you mentioned that the, the, uh, the fairly common cultural misconception in, in corporate America is that sustainability initiatives are often either not revenue drivers or they're more expensive than the BAU alternative, but you've just given one great example about hauling fees that actually there is an alternative to a hauling, a landfill hauling contract that's actually um, less expensive. So that, that's great. And just let me just mention so, there, Allison, just one other thing. Isn't it logical yeah. that if we utilize the assets under our management more efficiently, that we would generate value for our organizations. It just makes sense. It's a basic business principle that when it comes to food, for some reason, we have, the, we have permission to not be responsible in the way we manage these assets, that we could justify commingling them with cardboard and plastic and other things that go to transfer stations. It's deplorable. I mean, at the end of the day, even if we don't come up with an awesome solution like Amanda's company has, the absolute last stop for food should be the creation of future soil systems or energy, but absolutely never make it to landfill. That should just be completely an unacceptable solution. Great. And, and I wish we had time to get into waste and energy in this call, but we only have about 45 minutes uh, with each other before opening this up to questions. So maybe we'll do another, another uh, panel on just on waste to energy. Um, Ricky, have your clients uh, encountered any cultural challenges as they're building urban agricultural projects? Well, I think one of the things we see, and this gets back to um, maybe what, what, what Thomas has seen, is um, you know, it's so much easier to start when, when you're starting an operation from scratch. It's so much easier to build in um, kind of zero waste initiatives into your core operation. It's so much harder to go back in time. And, um, and actually, I want to just, for, for the audience that maybe doesn't know Baldor, maybe people that are on the West Coast or, or whatever, um, Thomas, can you give a little perspective just in terms of how big Baldor is, how much food you, you move, or how many employees you have, just to understand, uh, you know, because I think it's, it's a great show of the, the leadership that, that Baldor has shown and that you've shown to be able to go into this company and actually get it done, because that's the excuse that I see a lot of bigger companies give is, we're too big, you know, it's too hard to do this. Um, yeah, no, I appreciate that, Ricky, because without a leadership team commitment to this, to a sustainability, what I call strategy, because we have 25 initiatives that make up our strategy. Um, management of food represents about five of them. There are 20 other sustainability initiatives, which we won't get into today, but those have to have the blessing of the leadership team. And you make a very, very good point. It is very difficult to create those SOP or standard operating procedure changes. Uh, but just to give you the sense of the scale, in New York City on any given day, we're roughly 250, I'm sorry, 350 trucks. 
Um, we're about 2,000 plus employees now. Our headquarters is in the Bronx. We're one of the largest employers in the borough of the Bronx. And about 80% of our employees live within the five boroughs. So we are absolutely a New York City business. Uh, we also have um, locations in Boston and DC. So we really scour that Northeast corridor, uh, distributing produce mainly, but also specialty food, uh, everything except fish to our, our partners. And I'll just make a shout out to all the restaurant partners that we've done business with all these years and who are hurting so desperately these days. Um, and we ourselves have had a morph in our business over the last few days so that we can be uh, re relevant by attracting new customers like the, our retail partners and, and some of the other things that we're doing to survive. We're just so grateful for our broader community that, that supports us because those original, those channels we had two weeks ago, those have all been disrupted. So again, even that takes a leadership commitment to make those changes happen so that the business can survive. And, and all of our sustainability initiatives are no different. And then Allison, the other thing I wanted to, to add is, you know, we work with a lot of people that do, again, because they're early stage, they come in with um, a lot of idealism and, and they, they wanna build their operations as, as profitably and as sustainably as possible. And, you know, sometimes you do have to make trade-offs. Um, but sometimes that's because the infrastructure just doesn't necessarily exist to do um, everything that you want to do, right? So an example is, um, you know, let's say you want to uh, start a, a rooftop greenhouse and you want to use excess heat from the building. Um, in theory, that is a great way to create more of a, of a closed loop um, system. In reality, it's really, really difficult to do that if you don't have um, multiple stakeholders on board. Um, if you, you know, it's much harder to do once the building is already built, right? Versus if it's a new development. Um, and so all of that, just to say that, you know, again, one of the things we really try to advocate for is, um, is system level change. So I mentioned before what we've done with New York City in terms of trying to advocate for a comprehensive urban agriculture plan. Um, and, and it's something that a lot of other cities have done. Um, that can really help to incentivize uh, developers and all sorts of different stakeholders to consider um, or, or to actually incentivize them through um, you know, tax incentives uh, and things like that um, to actually consider you know, how urban agriculture can be integrated in, in multiple ways. It's much easier to do that when you're, when you're starting from scratch versus when you're trying to just insert a project into the built environment. Great. Great examples. Um, all right, well, I have a couple more questions for our panelists and then we'll open up the final 10 minutes to Q&A from those on the phone. For those on the phone, feel free to start sending us your questions through Twitter, Facebook, or YouTube. We're collecting them through three channels and I have a small team helping me compile them. Um, and so if we get multiple questions on the same topic, we will ask some of our panelists. Um, so let, let's think upstream for a bit. So, so Baldor is providing specialty foods to retailers. Ricky, you're helping um, vertical farming and urban ag agriculture. And Amanda, you're selling a, a consumer product that the, retail, that the consumer will see only after it's beautifully packaged and ready to use. But obviously, we know that there's um, agricultural waste and other inefficiencies that occur upstream. Can we maybe start with you, Ricky, and, and talk about some of the less observable sources of waste that occur in the food and agricultural system. Yeah, so I mentioned before, um, you know, on-farm waste, which actually you can sort of break that apart. And actually the, the best resource for all of this and where I get most of my information is um, an organization called Refed. Um, so they're really the, I'd say the leading um, research and advocacy group for all things food waste. So they have a lot of great, great stats on their website. Um, but one of the things we, we, you generally see is a difference between developed and developing countries in terms of the percentage of where their food waste comes from. In developed countries that have stronger supply chains, more cold storage, um, refrigerated trucks, better roads, you see a lot more of that food waste shifting towards consumers. So actually in the US, generally speaking, versus the rest of the world, um, we don't have quite as much waste happening on the farm. That doesn't mean there's not opportunity there. There's plenty. Um, whereas in developing countries, you see a lot of waste happening on the farm. So that's just meant, you know, I say that just to think about 
um, based on where you are. Hopefully, we have audience members from around the world. Um, you know, the the solutions might not be as complex as you think, um, and it's also really helpful to break them up into different parts of the food value chain. And then, just speaking more specifically about um, on the farm. You know, there's obviously just the pure waste that happens. And I mentioned before, sometimes it's things that you wouldn't naturally think about, like labor shortages. Another thing to really consider is the resources that are used, the inputs that are used to drive that, that farming operations. So that's more, that's thinking more operationally. Um, you know, agriculture is the, um, agriculture uses about 70% of all fresh water uh, around the globe. Um, it uses uh, a ton of land, more land than really any other industry around the world. Um, and so, and then fertilizer, which is actually a, a big cause of nitrogen fertilizer, a big cause of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so when you think about it from more of a, a resource standpoint, um, that's when it's really helpful. You're not necessarily seeing that waste on the farm, um, but you might see it in terms of um, fertilizer runoff, right, that causes algae blooms and oceans. So there's other things that happen further downstream or away from the farm that I would still consider wasteful. Um, and so we find, you know, looking at it from a, a resource or input standpoint um, is really a, a helpful way to also think about, um, you know, general waste on that operation. Great. Um, Tom, how about, how about at Baldor? Yeah, thank you. I, I love this question because it used to strike me as odd 20 so years ago, 30 years ago, maybe when I was younger, going to the store with my parents or my grandparents, and I would see like all the red peppers were exactly the same size. And I used to think, isn't that strange that vegetables and fruit are always the same size? Specification has led to a lot of waste on the farm. Um, if the farmer, if the grower shipper has certain orders for certain classifications or specifications of a particular fruit or vegetable, and they don't have orders for others, and those are picked. What is the farmer, or grower, shipper to do? The product makes it to the packing shed and the packing boxes, but they don't have orders for the products of those particular sizes that maybe were harvested. So the, my, the solution for the grower, shipper may be to discard it because they simply don't have a customer that wants it. We need to build a system that allows that grower, shipper to communicate out to the distribution community to say, hey, look, we harvested way more of this size lemon can you help us out and take this product? It shouldn't be such a difficult thing for the farmers to do. We actually should make it very easy for them to do it. But the other part would be, you know, those boxes themselves, the specifications, I would like to see much broader. I mean, a 225 count lemon, could we make it a 200 to 250 count lemon? So some will be in varying, varying sizes. I think specification drives a lot of what we see as waste. And then the second piece, is the imperfect produce opportunity. Um, and again, it speaks a little bit to the specification part, but it's a little bit different because it could be that something is blemished because of the way the vegetable rested against the soil, the way the sun may have hit it. Um, I like to think that we can be creative enough to utilize those food products. And of course, we're all very well aware of all of the movements out there to bring more and more of this food product to, to market. We now offer it, offer imperfect produce to our customers I like we offer everything else. And I'm just excited that we continue to grow that category because ultimately it will be the chefs and our home cooks that will use this food product that will allow the farmer to glean a little bit more value from their harvest, will help bolster their, their businesses. Maybe it'll allow them to grow a little bit less. And as Ricky pointed out, so much land is used. You know, 18% of the fertilizer that's used to grow the food that we grow in the United States this year will grow food that we don't eat. And 21% of that fresh water that Ricky referred to will be used to grow vegetables and fruit that we will not eat. So could we downsize the amount of cropland we use, give that back, so to speak, to nature, and use less water, use less human resources, waste less food, and bring that food to the imperfect food, that is, or the food out, out of specification to market somehow so that we can have a dramatically positive impact on our environment, help the farmer create economic value for them. So I love the question, thank you. All right, such great ideas. Um, uh, I'm so glad we're doing this. So um, uh, Amanda, if I, can, if I can put you on the spot here, um, 
with related to, with regard to kind of upstream waste sourcing, if you can shed some light on, on kind of how how you're sourcing um, food waste and are there kind of uncon unconventional sources of seed stock that that you then turn to value through your products? Yeah, the way that I view it is the difference between consumable. Um, food that would otherwise be wasted or non-consumable. And there are, I think, a number of companies that are going after consumable food waste to make other food products um, or to make like pet food or animal feed. And that food has a higher value. It's more competitive. We're really going after the, the harder part of the equation. We're going after non-consumable food waste, mixed pre and post food waste, um, uh, just mixed food waste in general. You know, we take everything from meat, dairy, prepared foods, um, shellfish. We've um, we've seen we've seen a lot, and you know, we decided that you know, we wanted to be a real waste solution, and we wanted to take the you know most difficult, messiest part of the waste stream and try to create value from it. So. On the feedstock end of our business, we work with waste haulers. We have a demo facility in New Jersey that we've been running for about two years um, in partnership with a um, waste hauler in the city. And, um, and we, we, we accept waste from them. Um, and that's how we, we, we work specifically with, um, with waste haulers for that. But we're going after um, the more difficult part of this equation, which is also why it's taken me six years. Um, but it was important to me to, to broaden the part of the waste stream that we were looking at to the part of the waste stream that like really needs to be addressed. Great. All right. Well, each of you is an innovator in his or her own right. And you are thinking about adapting the current food system to a future system that's more desirable and less wasteful than today. So I'd like to ask you all to look into your magic eight balls for those of us on the phone um, who are looking to learn from you and um, future cast a bit. So tell us so for the segment of the food system that you work in, what do you think things will look like in 10 years? Um, Ricky, why don't we start with you? I'll give you my overly optimistic view then, I guess, um, in these difficult times. Yeah. I think number one, it starts with, we need to respect farmers more in this country and around the world. Um, the average age of farmers in the US is almost 60. It's a similar number across the rest of the world. Why is that happening? It's because young people don't want to follow in the footsteps of, um, of previous generations. Why is that? Farmers in this country on average earn a negative income. Think about that. These are people that work around the clock. You know, they have basically no security, right? In terms of what the climate is gonna do. Is it gonna rain? Is it not gonna rain? Floods, droughts, um, and, and they earn negative income on average. So that's because we have a system in place that pushes them to continue operating, continue growing the same things, continue selling into a commodity mar market where they do not control the prices whatsoever. So, you know, the, the good thing, I think the positive thing is further downstream, diets are shifting rapidly. That's good. People are shifting towards more plant-based diets. We're seeing some of the things that Thomas talked about. You know, you have the Dan Barbers of the world that are really driving people to, um, towards more biodiversity um, in terms of, you know, what they're eating, what goes on their plate, um, what chefs are ordering, what they're interested in. Um, what we need to figure out is a way to better incentivize farmers uh, to grow those products at, at a greater scale um, and to reward the ones that do and, and do so in a less resource intensive manner. Um, so I've talked a bit about controlled environment agriculture, um, hydroponics, aquaponics, great ways to use um, less water, use less land. Um, you know, another really important part of this is regenerative agriculture. So soil-based systems where you are basically creating a closed loop system within the soil itself, feeding the microbiome um, of the soil and, and being less dependent on chemical fertilizers and herbicides and pesticides, et cetera. So there, there are examples out there. Um, 
And if you follow this space, you're probably seeing a lot of it. The problem is it's still less than 1% of, of the overall um, farming landscape. So we really urgently need to scale up those new solutions and we need to help farmers that are currently stuck um, you know, farming 10,000 acres uh, the same way that they were doing 40 years ago. Great, thanks Ricky, several predictions. Um, Amanda, how about you? What do you see uh, for your space in 10 years? Well, I think all the time, I feel very um, optimistic because I just see companies like Impossible Foods you know, raising tons of money and I just see the industry really going in the direction across the board in the food system towards more sustainability, towards more innovation. And so I think that that's just going to become the norm and it's going to be necessary for that to become the norm. Um, but I think that as we move forward, we're going to just see more and more companies like that sort of blow up um, and, and become you know, household names and, and long-term businesses. So I feel that that's going to be, I, I just think that, that that's going to continue, continue driving forward. I think that there are um, opportunities where maybe people will start getting more open to eating bugs and eating algae. And you know, these are all things that can also be part of a circular system that can be um, also aided by waste materials. And so I think that we're just going to become more and more resourceful in, uh, in being able to really connect these dots in terms of closing the loop and sustainability for our consumption and also um, how we handle our waste. Great, okay, and Tom, um, if I could ask also you to chime in, noting to all panelists that we have a terrific list of questions that I wanna get to a few of, so if we can keep all of our answers short and sweet and to the point, uh, we can get more of our, of our participants' questions answered. So Tom, what, what do things look like in 2030? Well, so um, there's, there are a number of things I'd love to talk about. I think we would we should definitely do a panel on regenerative agriculture. Ricky touched on it. Uh, regenerative agriculture touches on what I think will be the number one topic uh, on the minds of everyone, and we're going to build towards that, and that is the soil-to-soil -soil, uh, solution, meaning we start looking at soil, soil around us, wherever it is, as the most important um, aspect of our landscape. That is, we need to treasure our soil, build our soil, rebuild our soil, and protect our soil. You know, whenever we discard something uh, or take away land that's healthy, soil that's healthy, we are adding to all the problems that will lead to a, a climate change that we don't want. Uh, but soil is the answer. Soil will sequester the carbon uh, that we need to get out of the environment to reduce temperatures and, and, and manage our climate. So we need to build systems that fully utilize food for human consumption to create energy, to feed animals, to create energy and or build our soil system. That should be the only solution for food. And I believe that within the next 10 years, uh, sending food to landfill will be a thing of the past. And just to put all this into perspective, the first landfill in the United States opened 81 years ago. It wasn't that long ago. Before that, we used to put our food to use. That's the model we need to get back to. No food should be going to landfill for any reason. And I think that's the world we're living in 2030. Great, terrific predictions. Um, okay, so Amanda, um, I've gotten a few questions from the group from you on the topic of um, what advice you would give startups exploring whether they can use food waste as a critical input to produce um, a circular product. So what challenges did you face Is that uh, with that input category? How did you source health considerations, et cetera? Um, all really great questions, and it's encouraging to see that there are more people who uh, want to get in this space now. It, it's tough. It was tough to raise money. Um, it's been, like, as I said, it, it's, it's been a, a slow road because there are so many factors and so many moving parts. You have to come up with a process for handling food waste, um, safety procedures. You have to operate machinery. Um, machinery that's very expensive. You um, need to have 
the ability to do Q and A, you need to have the ability to, you know, obviously develop that product, um, test that product. Uh, so there, there's a lot that goes into it. Um, I, I really think that when it comes to um, making a product from waste, so, story is just so important. And I think the reason why we've made it to where we are today is um, through the story and through learning how to tell that story and refining that story and being able to for people to get it because it's hard for people to visualize. Um, and so being able to help those visual visualize what you're doing um, and you know digest it, so to speak, um, is is a huge piece of it. Like for example, um, we spent months testing fragrances for the product because it's a product made from food waste. And when we talked to people about it, the first question that we were always asked was, what does it smell like? And so we spent a really, really long time and set really high standards um, for how it smelled, probably even more so than if we were just making a regular cleaning product um, because of that. And because we felt like that was something that we really, really needed to get right. Great, thank you. Um, okay, question for Tom and for Ricky. Um, what reactions do do you or do your clients get from customers who know about your zero waste food policy? Do they do this, does that influence a purchasing decision? Does that influence brand recognition? Does that influence a press hit or a like? Um, how are they responding to to your using food that would otherwise be wasted? Maybe we start with you, Tom. Yeah, so for Baldor, it's there is a whole host of customers that absolutely love it. This past Monday, I, I, I did a presentation alongside uh, Max Cavallari from New York Times Cafe, who told me quite bluntly, he said, I love doing business with Baldor, but I'm particularly fond of the fact that sustainability is such an important aspect of the business. Um, I'm, I believe that our customer base chefs in particular really are concerned about the quality of food, the nutritional value, the, the, the delicious taste of food um, for their client, for their clients. Obviously that's the business they run and they know that a healthy earth is going to provide a better product. They want to know that the distributors they do business with, the farms that grow the food that they buy are doing so in a sustainable and responsible way. And so if a company is not stepping up, and making sure that they are running a regenerative, sustainable operation, then they're going to see in the future that their customers, and maybe this is another prediction, their customers are going to find a, a distributor or partner who does. Great. And um, Ricky, any thoughts? I think it, it probably depends on um, who these farms are selling to, frankly. You know, uh, Baldor may be an exception. But with, if, if you're selling to a, a you know, typical middleman, there's going to be a lot less transparency in terms of um, you know, how the, the connection between the end consumer and the farm itself. Um, and therefore, there's just going to be fewer questions. Um, uh, so it, it, if, if you're able to create a really strong brand, um, and we've seen examples like this Farm One, which was actually a, a, an early client of ours, They've created a really strong brand. They're selling directly to restaurants. Um, Gotham Greens, a larger scale farm that, that's created a really strong brand. Um, so it gets back to Amanda's point, I think, of, of storytelling matters. If you do that really effectively, then yes. Um, if you're not doing that effectively or you're not getting right in front of the end consumer, then it's really challenging. Yeah, thank you. Um, and certainly we've seen with sustainable packaging considerations, so lightweighting material switching to more climate friendly solutions and um, using recycled content that the brands that educate their consumers and market the product sustainability attributes outperform, at least in the consumer packaged goods categories. And, and Unilever has some, some great data as does um, as NYU. Um, all right. So I think next question, Tom, is, is for you and shifting over into packaging. Um, you've gotten kudos from a couple of people uh, for your very progressive sustainability work in, in, in eliminating food waste. Um, there's a question on how Baldor um, incorporates sustainability into your packing and shipping uh, considerations. So do you use reusable containers? Do you use recycled content? Um, can you speak a little bit here to, to that? 
Yeah, so that's a great question. I'm, I'm grateful for that question because it is our greatest challenge when we think about um, packaging. We we have an opportunity to buy uh, polylactic acid uh, based products uh, for packaging of our fresh cuts, for example, and that's all well and good, and we can do that, and it's going to cost us a little bit more money, and, and we we're okay with that because of because of who we are as a company. But the reality is, if in the recycling stream that container that we we've purchased for our product gets commingled with a PET plastic container, we're going to skunk the whole recycling stream. So really what we what we need to do is think beyond Baldor and think bigger about solutions for these containers that are comprehensive so that all of them are in fact recycling. And just for the audience, it's important to know the different types of or different ingredients that go into making different plastic containers, whether they are PET based or petroleum based or polylactic acid based or sugarcane based, for example, they can't be commingled to make a future product. So we want to, we really want, we really need a comprehensive change. It's not just something Valor can do. But what we can do is we can influence the boxes that the produce comes in and we're pushing our grower shippers to move towards non-wax boxes, cardboard boxes that are recyclable. Another one of my, on my list in the next 10 years I'd like to see that the produce industry moves to 100% recycled plastic crate shipping of all produce. And that way, it, we have a system in place where 100% of these boxes can be captured, reused, you know, hopefully hundreds of times, maybe not hundreds, but at least 100, and get completely out of cardboard. But in the short term, we're making a commitment to say to our grower shippers, hey, can you get a responsible box, to a, a box made responsibly that can be recycled whenever possible? to reduce the amount of wax going to land. So we're looking at this issue, but it's a complex one. Great, great. And Amanda, you already addressed the, the conscious decision to, to use aluminum, so, um, so kudos to you. Um, all right, so we have, um, I think as our, as our final question um, for the evening, we have a great question about municipal engagement. Um, so the question is following up on what Ricky brought up, the question for all panelists, what other actions should municipalities take to enable zero waste solutions in by by corporate actors, by household actors, by really everybody involved in the in the urban um, in the urban system? So why don't I start with um, Ricky for this one? Um, let's see. I'm, I'm trying to just think of examples right now. Um, I think what we're seeing is. You know, we have a, a full-time staff member based in Amsterdam. Um, our founder, Henry Gordon Smith, spends probably close to half of his time in, in Europe as well, bouncing around. And, um, we're definitely seeing that there's um, there's governments there, municipalities, but even um, you know, the, the Welsh government, for example, has a lot of incentive programs right now for circular economy uh, initiatives, especially in the food system. Um, so we're seeing generally there, there's a lot more leadership than what's happening here. Here, I think it's still happening. It's still being driven more from an advocacy um, standpoint. Um, so you're seeing, um, you know, community groups, um, small composting groups, uh, the Community Gardening Coalition here in New York City um, has done a lot of great advocacy work. Um, and it, it's, it's really more, I would say, of a grassroots kind of ground up approach for the most part in the US. Um, there's exceptions to that. A good example is the city of Atlanta. We worked closely with them to do a, a conference series for a number of years. They were actually the first city to hire a director of urban agriculture to sit in the mayor's office. Um, and two other cities have followed recently, Philly and, and DC, to hire for that role. So um, yeah, from more of an agriculture standpoint, I would say it's happening. Um, one other point, maybe Thomas can speak to this is, um, you know, just the, the New York City, for example, pays the city taxpayer money funds um, sending uh, our, our waste to landfills in, in other states. If you look at the total bill of that, it's about $400 million total just to haul residential waste. Of that, about a third is organic waste. Most, most of the organic waste is food waste. So about $100 million, maybe a little bit more, of taxpayer money in New York City is going to send food waste to landfill right now. Um, so, you know, we can do something about that, but also from the city standpoint, that should not be viewed as a cost of doing business. To Thomas's point, that's an opportunity. 
Um, so, you know, we should not be spending that money. And, and I think there's a lot of other great solutions within that, that web. Thank you. Um, Tom, how about you? Yeah, well, ca capitalizing on what Ricky said, I, I believe that the city of New York has done a lot of really great things. I Last year, I was the keynote at the Zero Waste uh, Conference that the Sanitation Department put on, which was, I thought, an amazing event. Um, you know, when we think about food, as Ricky pointed out, hundred at least $100 million worth of the haul going to landfill is food. It's probably closer to $140 million, you know, what's $40 million? Um, but, he, but if we treated all that food differently here in the city of New York, that is, if we extracted all the moisture from it, if we uh, pulverized it and turned it into a soil amendment, it could be used right here in the city of New York to rebuild the soil system in our city. We have, we have uh, parks all around the city that demand soil every year that we haul back into the city. So could we have a budget for $100 million to capture all this food, convert it into a usable soil amendment? and recreate our soil system in New York and add to that tab or decrease from that tab the cost of hauling all the soil in to manage our parks and, and recreational facilities. So there's a huge opportunity here. And I think uh, we really need to get, uh, put more pressure on the city to quite frankly, ban at the residential level and at the commercial level, ever commingling food with the waste stream. It should be something that's done nowhere in the world, let alone the United States. Tom, you just described what we do. <laughs> um, we actually have um, we have several tons of soil amendment that we've been storing for the spring, um, and we're going to be looking for a partner for that soon. And then all the liquids are uh, being made into a cleaning product. Um, so that is very very close to to what we've been working on. Great. Well, Amanda, you that um, that was a terrific way to end this. Um, this hour and, and two minutes that we've all been on the phone. Um, so uh, on behalf of um, uh, Urban X and on behalf of myself from Closed Loop Partners, we just wanted to thank all of you for signing in after your work day, which you've, you've hopefully been doing from home today. Um, and I think Miriam wanted to just let everybody know about an upcoming application date for an Urban X closing. Uh, yeah, thank you everyone and thank you everyone who joined from home. I was following the conversation. It was very lively online. Um, yeah, I just want to remind folks we have our deadline for applications in two, three weeks. Um, we would love to see more applications in the food and waste space, of course, as well as general resilience for cities. And um, yeah, our demo day on April 21st also will be remote like this. So yeah, stay tuned. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Stay healthy and safe.